بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته My dear brothers and sisters in Islam I greet you with the beautiful greeting which we explained last week a greeting full of peace and baraka and rahma from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I pray that whatever beautiful meanings could be ascribed to this greeting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes that a reality for you and for every listener and for all of those who you pass it on to and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returns all of that to me as well because I am definitely more in need of it than anybody else. Having said that, I apologize. My neighbor has decided to practice his saxophone. It's background music that I had nothing to do with, I promise. So uh, please, if it does disturb you a little bit, <laughs> please, please excuse me. Having said that, let us discuss a few things with regards to the fast of Ramadan. The topic of today's lecture is actually the prophetic fast. How did Rasulullah fast? So we will discuss this in light of the verse of Quran and in light of a couple of ahadith. And I want everybody to focus on two verses of Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنَ هُدًى لِلنَّاسِ وَبَيِّنَاتِ مِنَ الْهُدَى وَالْفُرْقَانِ فَمَنْ شَاهِدَ مِنْكُمْ وَشَهْرَ فَلْيَصُمْهُ That the month of Ramadan is the month in which the Quran has been revealed. Right? It has been revealed as a means of guidance for mankind and a clear, with clear verses of guidance and a distinction between right and wrong, truth and falsehood. Right? I recently, actually today, Somebody sent me a couple of objections that a, a Christian brother had made against Islam. And uh, Allahu Akbar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired me with some really, really, I think, pretty decent answers. Bearing in mind that I, I was somewhat of a Christian before. So, uh, it is clear verses of truth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about this in the Quran. فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ زَيْغِ Those whose hearts are deviated. فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ زَيْغٌ فَيَتَّبِعُونَ مَا تَشَابَهَ مِنْهُ إِبْتِغَاءَ الْفِتْنَةِ وَابْتِغَاءَ تَأْوِيلِهُ وَمَا يَعَلَمُ تَأْوِيلَهُ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Right? Those whose hearts are deviated and whose hearts are crooked. Right? They are the ones who will look for verses that seem to be contradictory or seem not to make much sense and they will latch on to only those seeking what? Fitna. And seeking to give some false interpretation to it. Allah says only Allah knows the interpretation. So, um, those of deep knowledge and deep understanding would say that... Um, we believe in it. Everything comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They do not make stories up, make up funny interpretations. We stick to what has been mentioned in the Quran and the hadith, the authentic hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the acceptable meanings and interpretations as have been explained and mentioned in the tafasir. And only those with true understanding would understand what is being said to them, right? Those whose hearts are deviated. Anyway, the Quran has clear verses of guidance. Those whose hearts are deviated, they are the ones who will be deprived of guidance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has op openly, and, and another thing, openly mentioned all the, 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 the signs and the truth of Islam. It's clear and it's evident. And another thing that I wanted to, uh, interrupted myself while I was saying something. The barakah of ADD, brothers and sisters in Islam. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made every verse clear. And this is another thing that I want to mention. We we have this we make this mistake that we feel that we need to convince other people. We don't have to convince other people. We have to live the message of Islam. We have to show people what it means to be a Muslim. We have to give them the message. Listen to the Adhan. Have we mentioned anything besides a pure, simple da'wah to Islam? Right. This, brothers and sisters in Islam, was one of the beautiful, um, you know, ibadat of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in Ramadan that he would engage in da'wah. He would convince, he would go and convey the message of Islam, and he would spread the message of Islam. So let us see that if we could convey the message of Islam to somebody, you know, we don't have to. We don't have to be emotional. We just have to give a beautiful message. You know, I, I, <laughs> a friend of mine walked into a shop one day and there was a, a Christian brother standing by the shop. And as he walked in, the man reached out and said to him, Jesus loves you. 
So he looked at the brother and he said, I know, bro, but Muhammad loves me more. <laughs> but think about this. How many of us have gone to people and say, you know what? There's hope for you. Allah loves you. I have a friend, Mufti Abu Bakr, um, sorry, Mufti Muhammad Aku from, from Newcastle. If he gets a phone call, like, you know, those dry calling and, and, and sir, we'd like to know if you'd be interested in our service. He, he would be like, no, I'm not actually interested in your service, but you've already paid for this minute. So allow me to give you the most important message of your life. You are going to only live once. You are going to leave this world. If you've left this world and you've recognized your creator, then you've been successful. And if you've left this world without doing so, you would be doomed. So I am taking this opportunity to give you the message of Islam. Say that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger and you will be successful. If I've given you something to think about, please do further research. I hope you have a nice day and may Allah guide you. And he puts the phone down. It's a simple message. You've given them something to think about. You've done your duty. That was one of the beautiful aspects and acts of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in the month of Ramadan. Another hadith mentions that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was extremely, extremely generous. Generosity like you and I could not believe. Let me put, it to, put you into perspective, right? If, if you give your money away, right? That's generous, okay? But if you give money to your wife, which is supposed to be the grocery money for the month, right? And you come home and she's given all of that money away in charity. Now, <laughs> let's think about Ramadan here. You come home. Where's the samosas? <laughs> no, I gave them in charity. Ooh, brother, I know who you're going to make dua for Maghrib time to get punished by Allah. Think about this. Think about this, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was so generous that he would give his wives their entire year's uh, stipend, one shot, once off. And then that money would be given away in charity. Within a week, he'd walk into his house, ask Aisha radiallahu anha, is there anything to eat? Uh, basically, I've just given you a year's worth of grocery money. Have you bought something? And she says, no, no, there's nothing to eat. And I've given all that money in charity. And what would he say? Well, then I'm fasting. No fighting, no upset. That, brothers and sisters in Islam, is generosity. He comes home. Somebody had gifted him a goat. And uh, his wife slaughtered the goat for him. Aisha radiallahu anha. And because he enjoyed eating the shoulder and the forearm of the goat, uh, she kept that part. And when he walked in, she triumphantly and very proudly said to him that, Alhamdulillah, I've given the entire goat away. I've only kept the shoulder for you. And he looked at her and he said, No, Aisha. You've kept the entire goat. You've only not kept the shoulder for me. Trying to draw her attention to generosity. That what you've spent in, 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 in the path of Allah, that is being stored up for you in Akhirah. You will never, ever, ever lose that reward. That is what you've kept. What you've decided to keep in this dunya is what you're going to be using. And you will not get the everlasting reward thereof. Think about this. This is generosity. But in the hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is described as more generous than the wind in Ramadan. Now I ask you this beautiful question. Allahu Akbar. I'm feeling emotional when I say this to you. Allahu Akbar. Alhamd. You and I cannot believe the generosity of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A sahabi, a wealthy sahabi, Abdurrahman bin Auf, multi, I don't even say gajillionaire, multi gajillionaire. He asks Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, seeing him wearing a new loin cloth, what we refer to as a lungi. And he says, Ya Rasulullah, please may I have your lungi. It's not like he can't go and buy. He can go buy a lungi 10 times better. He was a gajilene. He could have imported his lungi from anywhere in the world. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, despite the fact that he was one of the wealthiest people on earth, says to him, no problem. He goes home. He puts his old one on and he sends the new one to Abdurrahman bin Auf. The other sahaba went to him and said, Abdurrahman, man, he didn't have anything else to wear. You went and asked him for it. He said, well, Allah I didn't ask for any other reason. I wanted to be buried in that lungi. Allahu Akbar, walillahi alhamd. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was more generous than the wind. Does the wind discriminate who it gives to? That the wind blows on anyone and everyone, male and female, Muslim, non-Muslim, adult and child alike, everyone. So in Ramadan, let us see. You know, let it not be that in Ramadan we have a spread and our domestic workers are there in the house making the samosas, folding the samosas, frying the samosas, making the food for us, putting the table down and it... And when it's time to eat brothers and sisters in Islam, she doesn't even get one. Think about that. How do we treat our domestic servants? This is how the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was. He was more generous than the wind in Ramadan. Let us speak about the ibadah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We all know 
the hadith. I hope we all know this hadith. And if we don't today, we're going to hear it. Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, a great, great sahabi of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa walks into the home of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa because he had that relationship. He would stand by the curtain and he would make salam. And if the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa did not respond, that was his permission to enter. The other Sahaba people used to think that he was family because he would just walk into the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa However, if he coughed, that was an in, uh, indication that I'm busy now and uh, you can make salam later to see if you can come in. So he walks into the home of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa One day we will describe how, oh man, Allahu Akbar, Allah. We will describe how that beautiful, simple home looked. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Right? He walks in. There was a little courtyard before the rooms and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is standing in his tahajjud salah. And he walks and he says, today I'm, I've got such a golden opportunity. I'm going to join the messenger of Allah, the greatest man ever to grace the surface of the earth with his presence. I am going to join him in prayer. He said, I couldn't manage. While I was standing there, he read like six Jews of Quran plus in the first, almost seven Jews of Quran in the first rakat. He said, hatta hamam to be su'u. Until I wanted to do something so bad. Sahaba was like, hey, bro, what were you thinking? You reckon I wanted to break my salah, but I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. So think about this. He would spend so much time in ibadah. Aisha radiallahu anha said to him, your feet are swollen. How do you, how do you, do, why do you do this to yourself? Why do you, in Afrikaans, go martle yourself. So why do you, uh, you know, why do you torture yourself like this? And he says, she says, Allah's forgiven you, even, even if hypothetically speaking in some different realm, I don't know where, but even hypothetically speaking, if you had to deliberately do something wrong, even that would have been forgiven. So why do you, why do you do this? Why do you push yourself like this? So he says, Afala akuna abdan shakura. Should I not be a grateful servant? Should I not be a grateful servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That Allah has given me so much. Allah has not, and we're not talking about money in this dunya. He's given him the position in dunya. We're talking about akhirah. That's what he drew our attention to. Allah has made me literally the greatest being in existence after himself. Should I not be a grateful servant and show Allah how much I appreciate that? Allah could have chosen anybody else, but He chose me. Think about that. Now let you and I contextualize this. Did you and I have to be Muslim? Did you and I have to have the opportunity to fast in Ramadan? Did you and I have to have the opportunity to get forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Did you and I have to have the opportunity of getting the rewards and benefits of fasting? Did you and I have to have the opportunity of making dua before iftar and having those duas answered? Did you and I have the, op the did you and I deserve the opportunity to say La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah and get salvation and entry into Jannah? Did you and I deserve any of that? How about the hadith where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said that Allah has divided his rahmah, his mercy, into, 19, into 100 parts. 1% for this dunya, we mentioned this in the Jumu'ah lecture last week, in the Jumu'ah lecture. 1% for this dunya, 99 exclusively for the believers, those who say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, those who are Muslim, exclusively for them on the day of Qiyamah, that you and I deserve this. Never. There is nothing that anybody could possibly ever give or present or submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that could make him deserving of everlasting salvation and forgiveness. Nothing but nothing. You and I got it. You and I were given it. Some of you were fortunate to be born into it. Others like myself were fortunate to be given it free. So should we not also be grateful servants of Allah? Despite all this extreme exertion in ibadah in Ramadan, the hadith says that Aisha radiallahu said he used to pull up his socks, proverbially pull up his socks. He used to tie his, his loincloth tighter, meaning what? He used to really, really exert himself. He used to stay away from his wives at night, not engage in, in uh, intercourse or in, in intimacy, not because it's not halal. But because he was so busy in the ibadah, so engaged in the ibadah. Now you and I can't manage this. Remember what Mufti Ibrahim Desai said. Let us plan our work and work our plan. Draw up a simple, doable schedule for Ramadan. A simple, doable schedule after Fajr. Now we're in lockdown. We don't have to go to the masjid now. May Allah open the doors. Ya Allah. Not we don't have to go to the masjid. Unfortunately, we can't necessarily go to the masjid. But we read, try and wake up early. We're, gonna, we're going to wake up early for suhoor, right? Wake up a little bit earlier. Eat your suhoor and eat properly. 
and please get multivitamins and drink multivitamins with your suhoor. Suhoor is barakah. It is a time and an opportunity for us to make dua and practice on that sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So we wake up a little bit earlier. If you intended waking up half an hour before the time starts for fasting, wake up 40 minutes. You've got 10 extra minutes. Eat the same amount of food in the same amount of time. And even if you don't go and read even two rakats of salah, sit down on your musalla. Make your wudu. Sit down on your musalla. Say the kalima with love. Ten times. Say the name of Allah with love ten times. Say salawat al Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa with love and appreciation for what he has given us and the effort he has made for us to, ex to get this kalima with love ten times and make dua. You will see a dramatic improvement in the spirituality of your fast. Dramatic. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. May Allah grant us all tawfiq. Me first. Ya Rabbil Alameen. All of us. Me first though. <laughs> I'm not trying to be selfish. I'm also making dua for you, but Allahu Akbar, me first. I'm the most needy. Wallah, the Wallahi lo alimu qabiha sarirati. La bas salam alayya man yalqani. Wala a'radu anni. Wamalu suhbati. Wala bu'tu ba'da karamatin bihawani. Allahu Akbar, walilai alhamd. Allahu Akbar, what Imam Qahtani said in his nuniyat. Allahu Akbar. Those who understood, understood. I'm not going to uh, translate it because I'm just going to start crying and I don't have time to cry on this lecture. <laughs> Anyway, very emotional lecture, first lecture before Ramadan. I humbly appeal to everybody, let us learn from the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Let us try and be more generous in Ramadan, especially with those around us. Be generous with our love. Be generous with our appreciation. Be generous with compliments to our family members. Be generous with, with food, with clothing, with money if we can. Lockdown is a tough time for everybody. Be generous with our ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Try and spend a little bit more time. Don't go overboard because we can't manage overboard. One Ramadan I tried, I said I'm not going to eat any savories, no samosas, oh, no pies. Allahu Akbar. It lasted three days and I became ill, physically ill. Day four, I nailed the pies. I made a qada for the previous three days and I was perfectly fine. Alhamdulillah, next day, no head cold, no flu, no sniff, no nothing. So eat your pies, have your samosas, drink your coffee, do your thing. Please add your multivitamins as well, a little bit of extra water as well. But most importantly, when we are eating all these things and we are enjoying these bounties, let us thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let us spend a little bit extra time in dua, a little bit extra time in, 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 in dhikr, a little bit extra time appreciating and thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't go overboard. We won't manage it. We won't manage it. Plan your work. Simple, doable, how much I'm going to do extra after fajr. So you wake up early for your suhoor. Spend some time on your musalla, making dua, thanking Allah, a little bit of dhikr. The fajr time comes, let us give the adhan, perform the fajr salah, and after fajr, read, make it. So if you're reading in an Arabic Quran, there's 20 pages per juz, there's five salahs, four pages. If you read four pages of Quran after every salah, you will comfortably complete one juz daily. If you read five pages after every salah, that's one and a quarter juz daily. You will finish your khatam very, very easily on the 27th night of Ramadan. Try this, my brothers and sisters in Islam. Try this, please. And then after your Dhuhr Salah, again, before you go and sleep, you have wudu for Dhuhr Salah. Five pages of Quran, four pages of Quran. And if you can't manage it, one page of Quran, but a little bit extra. And when you're holding the Quran, thank Allah for that bounty because many people don't have a mushaf. I have so many stories I can tell you. Allahu Akbar in Russia when communists took over, etc. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Woman hadn't seen the Quran in 70 years. A Jamaat finally makes their way into her village in Russia and she runs up to them and asks them, do you have a copy of the Quran? They said, yes, they showed her the copy. She grabbed that Quran and she cried and cried cried and cried and she said i was a small child a few years old and the communists rocked into up there sorry they came into our village they destroyed everything they chased us out my sister was the only one who was learned in our family disappeared we were split i have never seen a quran since then i am now 70 odd years old in all that time i've never seen a quran all i wanted was before i die just to hold Allahu Akbar, just to hold the Mus'haf and we don't read it every day, brothers and sisters in Islam, when we hold that Qur'an, hold it with love and appreciation. Make the time for the Qur'an. I say this for myself first, because we have really, really 
we have we have fallen so short in our ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have fallen so short in appreciation. So this Ramadan, I'm not asking if, or encouraging everybody to go overboard and read 100 rakat nafil salah every day, finish 60 khatams of Quran. That is for the kamilin, those people, Allah Akbar, who have spent years and years spiritually training themselves. This Ramadan, we're in isolation. We're in permanent i'tikaf in our homes. Let us make this Ramadan a Ramadan of appreciation. Let us make this Ramadan a Ramadan of dhikr with love, of dua with love. Let us make this a Ramadan where we become a little bit more generous with what we have because we have so much that we take for granted. Let us see how much we can spend and give for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the first point we made about da'wah, if we can touch somebody's life with one beneficial uplifting statement then do so it would stand you in such good stead the hadith of rasulullah and i conclude states that sometimes a man would say one word and he'd think nothing of it but that one word would take him to the depths of jahannam and another man says one word not thinking much of it but he uplifts and he benefits somebody this is my own explanation right but that one word and it's because of the benefit that was derived and the, the change that came about in somebody's life because of that one word. It raises him to the highest levels of Jannah. Just one word. You can change the world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq and understanding. Again, whatever I have said that is correct is only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the barakah of his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the great favor that my mashayikh and my asatidha have conferred upon me by actually taking the time to teach somebody like me Allahu Akbar walillahi alham there's nothing we could say that could possibly express our gratitude Allahu Akbar right and whatever I've said that is incorrect is only from my nafs and shaitan and me falling prey to the whisperings of shaitan and my nafs and Allah and his rasul absolved completely thereof subhanallah bihamdi subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdika ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk